Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, yeah, thanks for coming. Beautiful day to be out and hear some good weatherization, insulation, air sealing. Um, so we're hosting uh, Brian Keith from uh, Northeast Training Organization uh, out, of ne out of Newport. Uh, they have another sister organization out of St. Johnsbury, I believe. And uh, so they cover the uh, limited income uh, weatherization, free weatherization for those people who qualify. Uh, and um, the, so they cover all of Orleans County and not yep. Caledonia County. Caledonia, Essex, and Orleans County. Oh yeah, and, but if you're in Lamoille County, you would have to go to Capstone, is it, in Montpelier? Yeah. Yeah, so it's just across the border in Wilkin. So uh, without further ado, Brian Keith from NITO uh, will uh, give a presentation and then do some question and answers for you. Brian. Yeah, thank you. So I handed out the weatherization um, system program income guidelines, income eligibility guidelines. So, um, you know, it's a quite a generous uh, offer. Um, the numbers will be changing come July, but I don't know what those numbers will be, but they always go up. So if you're under whatever that is for your family size, um, everything we do is free of charge. Um, and <coughs> You know, so if not for you, maybe somebody you know, you just pass that on. But so what happens in the process, and there's some applications over there, and if anybody does want to apply, um, I can help guide them with that. Um, but we also have a great opportunity for you just to call our office and do the application over the phone. Um, a lot of that information that's in the application would be taken down um, by the person answering the phone. And then they'll highlight on the application those things that they would need back from you, including your signature, in order for the uh, application to be processed. So then that person has now applied. So this is a person who lives in a single family home. That could be a mobile home. That could be a site built home. Or they're living in an apartment, a rented situation. Um, but as long as the person applying is income eligible, that's how it moves forward. Um, so. So once we complete that process, which includes um, verification of somebody's income, as well as looking at what their current use for fuel is and their electric use, um, that all gets compiled into their uh, folder into the application. I would come on in, don't be shy. <laughs> I, um, I'd be the first person that would come out to the homes in most, well, all of Caledonia County up in this neck of the woods to some degree, um, and sometimes up into, uh, well, actually all of Southern Essex County too. So, or my counterpart, Mark, Mark Jacobs, um, would be coming out of the Newport office. Um, and we would initially be walking through the home with our first concern to be to hear from the homeowner directly, the rent, you know, whether it's a home, the resident of the dwelling, what, what's your primary concern? What was it that prompted you to apply? What, do you, what would you like to have addressed? I will tell you honestly, um, I hear from folks, my drafty windows. <laughs> and um, and regrettably, regrettably, we don't do, I know back in the day, we used to do windows. Um, the programs used to do windows. I used to do construction back in the 80s. And I could always tell a home that was weatherized because of the style of windows that were put in. I don't know. It's just not the best return on, um, on the dollars that can be spent to tighten up a home. And the reality is in most homes, the cracks and crevices throughout uh, the top and the bottom of the building um, add up to as if you had a wide open window anyway. So that's where we aim to do our work is to air seal top and bottom and then to insulate around that. That said, if you've got a broken window and you know there's air infiltration, exfiltration going on there, we're going to address that. We're just not necessarily going to give you beautiful Marvin, you know, or Anderson windows. It's, we don't do that. We don't have the money for that. So, um, but we do want to hear the concerns and then make sure we're addressing them. 
So if somebody did tell me, oh, I have drafty windows, and it's great to see that there's some information over there about window dressers. It's a great option. There's a sample of what um, that product looks like the unpainted. No, and there's one being held up in the back. Um, so, and uh, they actually do come in sizes to fit your window. <laughs> so if your window's that big, they can be made to fit that too. Um, so it's not a one size fits all. And they also come, if you wanted uh, it white instead of natural, that's an option too. But that is a, an opportunity, and you can get up to 10 free units um, if, if you um, basically tell them I can't afford it. Um, so that's a great option. The other thing I'll refer people to is the USDA um, program, 504 program for, um, that can be used for home improvements. Um, and that may be another way to address the windows. Uh, Rural Edge does some work to help folks too. So, so if I hear that the concern is windows, I'm going to address that, but our program itself might not necessarily directly address that. Um, but then I want to hear what the other concerns are, and that gets factored into you know, um, how we can help. Um, basically, a lot of people, their, their concerns are pocketbook issues. I want to save money, um, right? Um, it could also be I want to do something to help the environment. Um, whatever it is, we're going to help make that happen in that home. So uh, the other thing I'm checking for when I'm at the home is any opportunities I can do immediately to help reduce somebody's electrical energy use. Um, it's getting harder and harder for me to find old incandescent light bulbs in a lot of homes because you can't buy those anymore in Vermont um, unless you're looking for very specific ones. Mark may know better than I do, but I can't find them. <laughs> um, but anyway, so, um, so we'll put in LED light bulbs. Um, we'll also offer the opportunity for replacing old um, appliances, refrigerators, freezers, washing machines. There's certain criteria that needs to be attended to to make sure that we can make that happen. Um, uh, we also will, um, as appropriate, install um, or have installed heat pump water heaters. That happened over here. So um, I can tell you the one that went in there, and that was in 2018, I was looking at the cost of that in 2018, and you can't touch it <laughs> for that price anymore. Uh, that was amazing to me, but anyway, so. Um, there is a limit to how many um, heat pump water heaters we can install because um, prices have changed a bit. So anyway, um, the other thing I'm going to be looking for when I'm in the home is concerns about any barriers that would be in the way of our weatherizing the home. Um, last week I was in a couple of different homes where I found vermiculite insulation. Anybody not know what it is? Do know what it is? Basically it's a um, it, it, it was, I suppose, a great product. Anybody garden here? I think everybody knows what vermiculite is if you garden. It's a, it's a great material. Um, but it happened to be that the materials that were brought here um, for insulation purposes um, came mostly from a mine in Libby, Montana, and that mine happened to have veins of asbestos running through it. And it could be that the home that has this vermiculite insulation up in their attic um, or down into their walls um, came from that mine and it may or may not have asbestos in it. The reality is it's very hard to verify that. You know, we typically would take three samples and um, it could be that none of those samples have it and the fourth one we didn't take has it. We just assume it's there and then we're going to work to um, address that, but it doesn't make it impossible to do the weatherization, um, but it will slow the works down a bit because the concern here is there's asbestos potentially in that home. So you'll be, for those that go to see the blower door um, demonstration, and there's information over there about what a blower door test is, we're not going to do a blower door test in a home. Um, we can, um, there are different ways to do them, but typically our primary way is to do a depressurization of the home, which basically creates the effect of a 15 mile an hour wind coming at your home from every direction. And then they'll take an infrared camera and go around and basically looking for where's the air leakage? Where's that happening? Um, but if we were to do that and there's 
suspicion of asbestos materials in the home, it could be drawing them into the living space and we don't want to do that. Because the other thing that we're going to be concerned about whenever we go into a home is the overall health and safety of the home and its occupants. So when I leave a home after going on that initial visit, um, you're going to end up with, um, if you don't already have them in your home, um, working smoke detectors <coughs> and a working work in, um, carbon monoxide alarm. Because again, that's a health and safety issue. Part of the health and safety issues we're also looking at is, um, you know, some people, um, I'll admit I was one of them. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I lived in a lot of old homes um, in my adult life, um, farm home, farmhouses, um, log home, um, great air exchange, if what you're concerned about is one, <laughs> one to maintain air quality. It's, I, the homes I lived in had great air exchange. <laughs> but the payoff uh, or the, with the loss on that um, was that uh, anytime I was trying to heat the home, it was going out. And if I tried to cool the home down, that was also going out uh, through that. So we're trying to um, narrow that loss uh, down. On average, we'll get a home down to about 30, 30 to 40% reduction in air exchange, um, that air loss. Um, and, um, but anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself on that. But so assuming there's no significant barriers, um, you know, besides doing some initial paperwork uh, to prepare for the uh, audit, auditor to come in, um, you know, and changing out light bulbs and maybe looking at refrigerators and whatnot, pretty much that wraps up my stage of the process. In about four to eight weeks after that, typically an auditor will come out to the home and do a much more thorough um, look through the home. Um, and they're going to um, basically measure up the entire house, um, record the floor plan, check the windows, measure up all your windows, all the exterior doors. They're going to do the blower door test, assuming they can do that. They're going to check the primary heat system and see how well that's working. If there's a concern about it, we're going to call in some, a technician to um, minimally do a clean and tune but we will also all the way up to replace an entire unit if that's what's necessary. Um, and sometimes we'll find situations where the heat system is just spewing out um, not so great you know, stuff, the carbon monoxide and whatnot, um, or it's, you know, it's got a cracked um, this or that. We're gonna replace these things. Uh, repair it is the primary, but replace it if necessary. Um, and then, uh, also upgrading and installing, if necessary, bath fans and or kitchen fans. Our primary go-to is typically the bath fan. So that's kind of, those fans will be tested by the auditor. And if need be, we'll install a new one. Um, if it's not moving adequate air, making air, adequate air exchange in that home. I'll just warn you guys up, up front. Uh, we do sometimes get calls from homeowners saying, I don't think my bath fan's working. And it's because they're so quiet, they can't hear it like they did the old one. Um, so we can assure them, just hold up a piece of paper and you can you know, suck it up in there. But um, that is the number one complaint we get about the bath fans is, I don't think they're working. They are, they're just designed to not drag you nuts. Um, anyway, so the auditor is gonna work up the, what's called the work scope um, and write up. Okay, here's our plan to aim at reducing the air exchange in your home, um, bringing it down to an, uh, a more reasonable level, and adding to or installing, if needed, any insulation materials. I think it was brought up ahead of time here that um, some people may have concerns about uh, the spray foam that is used to do the air sailing at the attic and in the um, basement levels. The spray foam that we use is a closed cell foam, um, not the open cell foam. Uh, last year, uh, Vermont Digger, I think, did a bit of an expose about the open cell uh, spray foam insulation. That's what, we're not using that. And I think also the product's been around long enough. You can see back in the day, um, 
stuff that had the formaldehyde in it and whatnot, um, you look at it 30 years later and it's just crumbling, right? That's not what we're using. <laughs> that said, when the, our crew, when they're installing it, they're wearing masks, we're doing, um, you know, ventilation in the area that it's being used because it's not something that as it's actively being used you want to be breathing in, but people can be in the home and it's safe for that to happen. But if people are concerned about that, we can provide the safety data sheets for, um, regarding that. Um, but that's our primary method for air sealing. Um, anyway, and when the auditor presents that work scope to um, the home, uh, to the applicant, the weatherization applicant, that's the opportunity if there are any concerns to raise those with the auditor and say, hey, could you explain this or that or why this angle versus that. Um, but then once it's signed, it's assumed that everything that's listed in there is agreed to. Um, so we do ask people to review those carefully. And if you do have questions, it's, it's best to ask ahead of time. The crew will come, then come out and do uh, the installation of whatever measures are accounted for in the work scope. And if necessary, we're pulling in subcontractors, typically, you know, if we're dealing with um, working on the heat system. Um, sometimes there's repairs to the roof that need to be done. If it's a minor repair, we can do it. Sometimes we're going to pull in a contractor if it's something bigger. If it's much bigger than um, what our allowable expenses are, that's going to be a conversation about um, maybe tapping into a USDA uh, program or working with Rural Edge to take care of some things. There are some times when, unfortunately, we do have to defer the project because if somebody has a massively leaky roof, um, again, we're limited in the funding as to what we can address, but the leaky roof needs to be taken care of before we can put the insulation in because it's just going to compromise the insulation. So anyway, there are um, sometimes things come up. Uh, my experience is that, that more often than not, we're able to f work with the homeowner to figure things out and move forward. Um, sometimes things just get slowed down if there are significant issues. At the end of that process, after all the measures have been installed by the crew, a quality inspection is done. And if there's any concerns that come up, in that stage, um, they'll be addressed and the crew goes back out if needed to take care of that. Um, so but that's the general process. Um, anybody have any questions about that piece of it? Yes. Is the blower test, the blower door test, effective if done in the summer? So the, the problem, yeah, um, so if the, um, if you're using a smoke, um, you know, gun or whatnot, yeah, walking around that way, because um, what you're asking about is, are you going to pick up on that difference? And if the inside air temperature is basically the same as the outside air, it's hard to see, right, the variance. Right. Um, so one way about that is to do that very early in the morning, perhaps, um, when there is a temperature difference. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, so the auditors take those things into account. Yeah. Um, other questions? Um, this is kind of a high you know, level kind of thing. How does this program relate to the two different programs that were funded in the Inflation Reduction Act? There's like the homes, and which is like uh, you know performance based. Uh, program to get money if you reduce your, uh, you know, electricity use or you increase your efficiency by a certain amount. And then the other one is this whole electrification and energy here. Uh, I mean, I know the funding for that uh, has not arrived in most states, but how does this program, it should arrive this year, I think. How does your program fit with those? So, um, now we get into the territory, and this is where I'll tell a homeowner when I'm at a house. Um, we're going to answer whatever questions you have and pro provide you with timely customer service and treat you with respect throughout this process. That's basically the line that's uh, in the contract there. Um, 
And when it comes to answering the questions, I never answer a question I don't know the answer yeah. to. But and it's the auditor that would have that. But I'm looking at Mark back here, and he's shaking anybody, his head. Yeah. I mean, did anybody know at this point? Yeah, so I do know, I, I do know that there, whatever funding has come through, um, uh, one of the things that the auditor is looking at is um, how can this project specific home um, be funded? Yeah. Can it be drawn? Can we draw from that, or do we have to go straight? Uh, uh, DOE funding, um, okay. right? Okay. <sighs> Honest to goodness, I'm happy that I don't need to know that answer. We don't know it yet. Anyway, at some point, yeah, we'll yeah. know more. I'm the, I'm the field group guy that gives out the free stuff, the refrigerators and light bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, but yeah, no. Other questions? Yep. Uh, you said you get any questions about uh, the spray foam and the toxicity yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, I and brought it up briefly, yeah. What's the advantage of open cell versus, or closed cell that you now use versus closed cell? No. Closed versus open? Yeah. So that, um, I, I, I'm, I, I don't want to get too far into what I don't know. Um, to, you know if there's somebody here, do you have a thought on that, Mark? We only spray closed cell foam because it's um, an air seal and it's the best part per inch and it's vapor closed. You can get in trouble with open cell foam being vapor open and that seven days article was because the contractor put it in the wrong place and didn't install a, a vapor barrier. Okay. So it absorbed moisture and created issues. It closed, open cell has its place, but in our environment in New England, we pretty much just stick to closed cell. It's perfect for blow grade, like basements, mm. and it's really good in attics for air sealing too, and there's really no downsides. So closed cell foam is impermeable, impermeable to moisture. Right. It can't draw moisture. Open cell can, and therefore, it needs a vapor retarder or vapor barrier or something like that. And we don't get involved with that product. Yeah. It has its place in different climates, but not ours. Yeah. And, and the funny thing about the closed cell uh, spray foam up in an attic, um, very dry conditions oftentimes. Um, you know, so we're moving away whatever insulation material might be there to seal off. You're actually supposed to spray it with water a bit to help it adhere. Um, so, but yeah, because otherwise it, could, it just flakes off. Um, but um, so it's funny how it's not permeable, but at the application stage, it actually needs some level of moisture in order to adhere. I do not understand the science behind that. <laughs> Sorry, um, but anyway. But Brian, if you already have an energy audit done independently, mm -hmm. um, are you able to provide that data to? Or do you still I mean, you, you can. Um, the auditor may or may not choose to take it into account. Um, the auditor won't, typically just wants to do their own. Um, yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, what we do, we own the responsibility for. So if we're working off of somebody else's numbers, um, then, um, you know, and if for some reason those are wrong, that's. We're not going to take responsibility or li be held liable for that. We want to make sure if we're making a mistake, it's ours. No, actually, we want to make sure we don't make the mistake. <laughs> so. Good. <laughs> yeah, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So, what costs does the homeowner incur? Okay, everybody's sitting down for this. Oh, you want to sit down? You might want to sit down for this because <laughs> okay. the, the answer can always shock people. Um, so, everything we do is free of charge. If you meet the income guidelines, free of charge. Everything. Everything we do is free of charge. Again, there may be some things that need to be done. I've been in homes where, uh, so we, we, for us to do air sealing and insulation, we have to have a, a, some solid shell to work against, right? Um, so I've been in homes where uh, the sill is just rotted out beyond any ability for our crew to get in there and, you know, reasonably address it. It has to be done. Um, we're talking about jacking up this house, 
uh, pulling out, ripping out, and cutting back, and um, all the rotted material, cistern things up, and um, yeah, a, a, a complex pro process that is beyond weatherization because basically we want to be working against um, a, a, an adequate shell to uh, hold the air seal and hold the insulation. So as long as we're not talking that, everything is free. So the homeowner, in, in the one case I'm thinking of that comes immediately to mind, I connected him with the USDA 504 program um, and he was able to get a loan to have the work done. It was um, a 20-year loan. I think it cost him roughly about $5,000 to have that work done, which came out to, I think, $24 um, a month for 20 years. It's at 1% interest. There is no way that somebody you know, uh, can put money in the bank any bank and make that return. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity, but he was able to get that done and then we were able to go in and do our work. So, um, but other questions? Yes? You do hot water heat pumps? Hot, yes, heat pumps, hot, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> the, the, um, I, I, I must have been giving those away like candy. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, um, but we are um, limited currently as to how many um, I, um, we can for NEO to give out for the remainder <coughs> of our um, budget year. Um, so, but we will um, do that. Uh, there are a couple of different mechanisms, funding mechanisms. Um, that we can use, um, so. But yeah, uh, if it makes sense for that home, um, we'll we'll work to do that. Um, we'll also we can put in mini split heat pump systems, um, and that is more at the auditor level to size that up and determine is this appropriate for this home. Uh, but that's something we can do. Typically, it's, we're only talking one unit, so it would have to be the right home the right everything for that to work. Yeah. Yes? With the income limits that, that has there, um, it seems to me that there would be many, many, many households up here that would qualify. And how on earth can you meet the demand? What's, what's, what's your, so how, I, how's that look to, to your so, so I'll tell you right now, um, uh, we, we, we want you to You're apply. For work. We want you to apply, yeah, especially in this area. Yeah, um, yeah. That said, this time of year we call it mobile home season. Um, so um, if uh, somebody has a mobile home, um, we're going to work on that this time of year because once the snow starts packing up around the skirting, it makes it, it's more the ice actually <laughs> when it packs in there. But, the other thing is, you know, oftentimes we'll need to be working on the roof, and we just don't want um, our crews up on a roof um, in the winter time um, for safety reasons. So this time of year, we're more likely to focus on um, a mobile home. Um, so if somebody were to have a site-built home, I would go out there four to eight weeks after I go out there, the auditor's out there, but I'm currently telling people, don't expect the crew to be at your home until sometime late summer, early fall. Um, we have an obligation um, to actually um, have the work start eight months, within eight months from the day I'm there. So um, unless there's good cause not to, vermiculite, vermiculite might be a cause, but, um, or significant home repairs. But other, other than that, the expectation is we're going to be out there within eight months of my arrival. The crew will be out there within eight months doing the work. So there is, it can be a lag. Um, um, but uh, what I tell people is, you know, um, don't worry about whatever this wait list thing is. If there is one, we don't currently don't have that problem right now. Um, because uh, the longer you wait to apply, that just lengthens the wait period anyway, right, so. Mark, I'll pick, I saw yours first. 
You guys are a training organization? Yeah, so uh, recently, <laughs> um, so we have a, a new executive director, um, and she came in and um, told her you know, co former colleagues and acquaintances from her old life you know, where she's headed. And they said, well, what is that? <laughs> and there was a time when it was an employment and training organization. We're not that any longer. So there was a, a, um, a discussion about, you know, maybe we should look to change the name. I had suggested Northeast Efficiency and Thermal Performance Organization, all right? And that would take care of the NEATO and not having to get you know, I also suggest I also suggested Essex Caledonia Orleans Weatherization Service, otherwise known as ECOWS, where I'm standing in our field. <laughs> I thought that was a good one. Um, but anyway, so um, the board's elected to retain NEATO, but to make our tagline a little bit more, a little bigger. You can see it says weatherization program on the side. So my van outside, but we just want to make that bigger because <laughs> that's really what it is. Nito, it has a history, it has a you know a strong tradition in the past of being a, a great training organization, but we're not a training organization. So, how do you train and retain help? Because that's one of our issues is finding right. people who want to do this work, but it sounds like your staff, and how many crews do you have? So, let's see, three in St. Johnsbury, I think three up in Newport. Um, so I actually work out of the St. Johnsbury office, so I'm more familiar with that. Um, yeah, uh, um, I can tell you that one way is that uh, come July 1st, I hear that the wages are going up. Um, <laughs> That's one way to retrain. You pay well. People yeah, you pay well. Stay. Yeah, good benefits. It's the four-day work week. Oh, anybody want to apply? By the way, there's applications. Four-day work week. So I'm, I'm here on my day off. I was doing a thing yesterday on my day off, but it's a four-day work week, Monday through Thursday, um, and um, yeah, great medical benefits. So um, the starting wage currently is twenty dollars and sixteen cents for uh, somebody come on to the crew with no experience. Um, and then you know, I used to do construction a hundred years ago in the last century at least. Um, and you know, I was out on the crew when I first started the job, and I can tell you, yeah, I, I had I have some experience, but my experience was related to construction, and weatherization does use some of those that knowledge base, but it's, right? I actually learned a lot. <laughs> One thing I learned was maybe it wasn't so great that I lived in those old drafty farmhouses. Um, <laughs> certainly wasn't from my pocketbook, but anyway. I think I saw other hands, yeah. Uh, what's the latest thinking on insulating your walls on an old house that was never wrapped? Yeah. So what we do, um, uh, is if, if at all possible, we're going to insulate from the attic down, right, and blow down in. So we'll do dense pack. Um, so we'll, we've been in homes, um, and I've seen these myself back when I did construction, where um, cellulose insulation was blown into the wall cavity, but it was just kind of loosely blown in there and over time settled down, right? Um, today, it's dense packed in there to the point where you could literally peel away the sheathing uh, from inside or outside, and that's going to stay in that wall cavity. I've seen and heard horror stories of like the water getting into the insulation while sitting down the bottom like a giant sponge and rotting the tube before out. So going back to what I said earlier, if there's a, a problem with the roof, we want that fixed. If there's, you know, so that's my job is um, to go in and see if there's issues that are going to get in the way that need to be attended to first. Because you're right, it, it's not good. That said, and this could happen, and it doesn't matter what you have in your home. If you are got an unattended roof leak, something's going to rot eventually. So it's really on the homeowner to be paying attention to that. But we're not going to go in and insulate if there's active water uh, leakage. I think I saw another hand. If you have a lofted ceiling and no attic, um, 
how would you insulate the wall then? And how would you insulate the ceiling? Yeah. So the question is, does it need to be insulated, right? But um, so that's the first question, and is it adequate what's up there? But um, the how is, um, so again, uh, like, you know, we can insulate, if we can't get it from the attic down, um, I don't know, just looking across here, lifting off the clapboards there, um, peeling, peeling off, drilling through into the bays every 16 inches or so, um, we'll put in feelers to see where the studs are. Some of the old construction, I can tell you, it's not always, you know, whatever. There's, there's wood behind those walls for God knows what reason um, in places that you wouldn't necessarily think it should be. But anyway, we'll dense pack blow in through there and then plug it up and then put the um, clapboards back over if we're able or replace them if we're not able to use the existing ones. So we'll do it from the outside um, if necessary. Same with the ceiling um, that can be blown in from um, either top or bottom. Did you? Can I see your hand back over or maybe not? Okay. Don't feel pressured. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So, and and not just roof leaks. I'm also when I'm in the home, I'm also looking for plumbing leaks. Right. Um, I was at a home last week. Yeah, last week. No, wait a minute, it was this week. <laughs> anyway, um, and they had a um, propane water heater above their kitchen, and it was in an unconditioned attic space, and it was just ripe for a problem. You know, we are going to move that. The problem is, is it's going to cost us to move that, so I've left that to the auditor to figure out the pocketbook issue, but it will be moved because you know, that's going to create a problem if that, it's going to leak, they do. It doesn't have a, any, any system to catch that. But anything we do up in that area is going to get compromised by a, a leaky water heater. So, so we're going to look at plumbing issues. Electrical issues, if an old house has knob and tube wiring, may or may not be a concern to us. Um, the concern comes, um, for us, is for weatherization. I saw the eyebrows. <laughs> uh, for, for weatherization purposes, what we don't want to do in, a, say, an attic flat is blow over, you know, knob and tube wiring, right? Um, so if it's up in the attic flat or in outside walls, we will have it removed um, and upgraded. But general um, wiring, we're not code enforcers, so we're not going to go and upgrade any, right? But if knob and tube, we're going to take care of it if it interferes with our weatherization. Yeah. So, yeah, there's, there's all sorts of ifs, ands, or buts about this, but go ahead. Uh, another question on it. So, you'll see in the house next door, it has a basement, uh, and you spray foam the uh, upper part of the old rock foundation. Um, and you also put some air sealing of spray foam, I guess, in the uh, attic area along with cellulose. How yeah. would you approach that with a, uh, a trailer home? Um, do you spray foam the whole bottom underside of the floor or what? No, no. That um, typically what's going to happen is um, if insulation it needs to be added to, um, uh, oftentimes we end up um, putting Typar in and then strap in that to hold it, and then blow insulation into the cavities. You would put type R in? Type, type R under the belly. Okay. And strap to hold that in okay. place, okay. right? Because the type R isn't structurally strong enough itself to hold the weight of insulation. So we're going to strap and then blow in, and that would um, uh, be the way we'd approach it there. Into the roof, or, um, we're either going to come up, if we're able to, through a ridge, if there is a ridge, or through the sides uh, at the top and blow in that way. Um, you can do the, them from the inside, but then we're leaving plugs everywhere, and so we try to avoid that when all possible. Um, we're going to work from the outside. 
Yeah. But as far as spray foam, um, the only places we'd be concerned there is if there's penetrations um, coming from underneath up in. We'd want to make sure we're seeing it. So there's um, overflow pipe from the water tank would be one penetration going through the belly that we'd want to make sure that's sealed up. Right. And that would be the same thing with um, modular homes too, I suppose, that don't have a basement to approach yeah. that way. Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned about this home in particular, so I wrote up what we did and I have the permission to share that with the folks. <clears throat> but in this home, there was a 37% reduction in um, air loss, um, both, and actually I should say infiltration and exfiltration, air exchange is probably the better way to say that. Um, but but that's, gonna, that's our first priority is to uh, address um, air leakages and air sealing um, and then we insulate um, so so again in this home um, there were various things that were done um, some of them we used um, a high R um, uh, foam board other places we used loose fill insulation other places we used dense pack uh, it depends on the application of, of where it was we were working and what made sense in that area. Um, we more often than not in an older home will end up um, rebuilding the bulkhead door and make it much tighter. Um, regarding air sealing, just want to let folks know that sometimes what that means is in the interior of a home um, air sealing may involve like um, if there's cracks in the ceiling, um, say the plaster, sheetrock, whatever. Um, we're going to tape and mud that to air seal, but not get to the point of um, prepping it for final paint, painting or anything. That's going to be on the homeowner. Um, in this one, in this home, and in, in a lot of most. Not every home, but in many of them, we end up reventing the dryers um, just because they're not always um, as safe as they could be. And so we'll, we'll take care of that. Um, we did, um, in their laundry room, um, extend their hydronic heat system into the laundry room. Um, uh, and in the crawl space area of the basement, which is the side of the home closest to here, we did put down plastic. Um, as a moisture barrier, um, and the other, the main part of the basement already had that done, so we didn't do it there. We ended up putting this is so this is back in 2017, 2018. We ended up putting in 38 light bulbs. Um, it's rare I do that many um, in a week, <coughs> let alone one house nowadays, because they're just more ubiquitous. Um, and again, that heat pump water heater, $2,500 <laughs> to put in a heat pump water heater. Um, I'm lucky if I can get them in at under four. Um, and then that's if everything's just a perfect fit. Um, so. Yeah, but do we want to move there now to see what we're... Any last question? 